sitting like classmates preparing for the NEET PG exam and uh, having a debate, uh, which is a wonderful way of learning. So to start with, what are the arteries that supply the tympanic membranes? Tympanic membranes are it's a tricky thing. Actually, it develops from all the three germinal layers, and it has got uh, supply from even uh, both the things. Sir. Like uh, ear has got supply from both external carotid and also internal carotid. What I say here is one you have to remember as atma, atma. You should remember the atma that is the anterior tympanic artery of the maxillary artery. That is the most important uh, uh, branch that is uh, helpful. So rest all, as you could see, all uh, branches of the maxillary artery and external carotid artery. So the most important is the maxillary artery, atma, you remember as atma. This is important, why? Because when the tympanic membrane uh, is showing cartwheel appearance, all those branches are all belonging to this uh, anti-tympanic artery of maxillary artery. And, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, as anyhow, I told you that it is seen as a cartwheel appearance in the acute separative artery media, in one of the stages of acute separative artery media. And uh, as a whole, tympanum is the middle ear, as we know that, and then it is being supplied by posterior auricular artery also, and middle meningeal branch uh, also, like from the right from the skull inside the front in the, the skull is coming. And a twig from the internal carotid artery is also coming. Great. So, what is the nerve supply of tympanic membrane? What is the trick of remembering it? Now supply, sir, it's uh, it's uh, like, you know, I, I, I don't think any other uh, bo body part is supplied with these many cranial nerves, like here, as you know that, uh, you know, so anteriorly, so five in front, ten behind, and uh, post to superiorly seven, just keep it like that, and medially nine. So if you are having any pain right from the middle ear, it will radiate towards the throat, as may by means of your glossopharyngeal nerve. That is the Jacobson's now. That is also bed in the bed of the tonsil, it is present. And second thing is anteriorly, A, anteriorly, if you take anteriorly in front, like crocodile festival, in front there is auriculotemporal no, five. Behind, so five into two is ten. Okay, something like that you can remember. Behind is ten. And post superiorly, as you know, seventh nerve is also involved. So as you know that in the house itself, Burger sign. So it is last sensation of the post superior part of the meatal wall. Is last in our uh, the uh, acoustic neuron which is pressing the seventh nerve. So, posterior superior sensation also lost. And medial to the tympanic membrane, it is a glossopharyngeal nerve, that is ninth cranial nerve. And uh, the as you know, the promontory is having that uh, uh, the, the tympanic plexus also. That is, uh, those are all the most important things. So, can uh, uh, no one can say that this is the only part in the body which is being supported by most of the cranial nerves. These many cranial nerves, but this much small organ. I don't know how sensitive the ear should be, as we think according to this. So, and once again, when we are trying to poke the posterior part of the canal wall, you should be very careful because it might stimulate the bradycardia. And patient, uh, at least uh, so one in thousand patients might fall down when we are doing syringing. Also, that should be kept in mind because of uh, vagal stimulation. Great. I hope this is information. So, the posterior wall is supplied by the vagus. That's the reason whenever we are operating, there is a chance that the Vago mimetic effect can lead to development of bradycardia. Wonderful. Now, perilymph versus endolymph is a lot of times one of the favorite MCQ. So, can we fill the blanks in? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, here, only I'll give the Indian flag concept. I'll give Indian flag concept. In the middle, white, above is orange, saffron, below is green. So, white color is the endo part, endolymph. Okay, as simple as that. And perilymph is surrounding both the endolymphs. Of course, this Indian flag concept, it's like a tube. So the endolymph is surrounded by perilymph. Endo is inside. Inside more is potassium. So peri is outside. Outside peri is sodium. That's as simple as that. So nothing much more to understand in this. So it's as simple as that concept. And uh, this particular endolymph tube is nothing but the cochlear duct, which is being surrounded completely by your uh, this, uh, perilymph. So as you can understand, as simple as that. Sodium in, out, uh, sodium outside and uh, perilymph inside. Okay. Great. So endolymph has potassium and perilymph has sodium and uh, peri is outside and endo is inside. And uh, endolymph is produced by the stream vascularis of the cochlea and by the dark cells. Now, yes, what is the auditory pathway from where it starts, where it goes, and um, how do we, is there any way to remember this? We can just say, 
So, fans of Virat Kohli can remember that like, Kohli or E. Kohli can also be remembered. E. E. Kohli M.A. So, Kohli has read uh, M.A. So, that is Master of Arts. So, E. E. Kohli M.A. E. E. is like, when you say, uh, at the end of the day, A is the auditory context. It has to go to the Trotman's area, the temporal lobe, etc., etc. E. is the eighth cranial lobe. As we know, it will start as a distal part. Distal is the one which is below, is it or not? If you are plucking a fruit from the plant, okay, from a tree, so the one which is available to us is the distal part. So the one which is above is the proximal part. So from there it goes towards the branches and then it goes towards the trunk and then it goes towards the root. So you can just remember as simple as that. E. E. coli MA. The same, don't remember as E. coli MA. E. E. coli MA will be useful for Bera also. Same thing like as you can say, we'll see the pits in the Bera also. So E. E. coli, ethno, distal part, proximal part. And then superior olivary nucleus, lateral lemniscus, inferior colliculus, medial geniculate body, auditory cortex. So of which uh, this, you know, five and uh, five fifth wave is the most important thing that is especially from the lateral lemniscus that we say in the pera. So it is very important. Why? Because it is like uh, when we are trying to see whether the pathway is existing or not is one thing and physiologically functional or not. So like heart is giving uh, electrocardiography, ECG waves. Some waves are produced by all these parts of the auditory tract, okay, so that uh, we can pick up the part which is not functioning, whether it is cochlear or retrocochlear, etc., etc. We'll be discussing the future. Which. So, E. E. coli MA is most important. Great, and uh, in fact, uh, one very common way to remember is the geniculate body happens to be medial. Geniculate yes. body is located nearer to the midbrain and. Um, uh, auditory is yes, which are lateral, but actually yes. geniculate body happens to be medial. And because geniculate body became medial, lemniscus happens to be lateral. So that's okay. the point. And uh, among the colliculi, superior colliculus sustari, inferior colliculus interi. That's what uh, we used to remember. Superior colliculus sustari. It will watch. That's the reason it is a visual pathway. Yes, superior colliculus sees. So, visual part. Inferior colliculus, interdi. In Telugu, interdi means uh, it listens. So, it is auditory part. Very good. So, so one thing, one more thing sir, to add for that also. So, the lateral geniculate body and medial geniculate body. So, I and this, the superior is related to that medial, and then this is that uh, the superior is related to the lateral, and this auditor is related to medial. Sir. I hope you got it. Yes. And uh, in cochlea, um, is it higher or lower frequencies in the basal turn and uh, is it higher or lower in the apex of the cochlea? So as you go up and up, sir, like you from 20,000 to 20, to 20, you go up, sir. So it is just like a staircase. As you know, in the modulus, it will be there and around it, it will be going up and up and then it will be decreasing in the order, like as you could see. So basal turn of cochlea and uh, this one. So the basal turn... Uh, typically will have the higher frequencies and progressively lower turns towards the apex of the cochlea. So uh, that is how it is commonly remembered. Now, how do we differentiate the deafness because of a problem in the cochlea versus retrocochlea? So what is the story about uh, uh, this very important uh, uh, MCQ in the exam set? Yes, sir. Based on this, this retrocochlear and cochlear, sir. One thing simply is that the cochlea is, I just say the student that cochlea is like an antenna. Nowadays, people know the DTH antenna. So it's like an antenna, and the cable comes from the antenna, and it is the retrocochlear. Just you can just remember like. So in our days, we used to have antenna. If any crow stands on the antenna, we used to have disturbance in the TV. Okay. These kids may not be knowing that, of course, but DTH is there. That is one, one way that you can say. So cochlea, retrocochlear, especially once you should have some basic idea about the examples. Cochlea is minier species. So cochlea has got, once again, same thing like an Indian flag, as you should know, so that the three compartments are there. So endolymph is the white compartment of the Indian flag. It is going to swell up, and then it is going to give some amount of distortion. So as you know that this cochlea is having these hair cells, etc., etc., and it is going to have some amount of cochlea now that is going to be formed and it is going to form uh, into the cochlear now and then form like that. And then retrocochlear is beyond that. As you can see, once the, this particular sensory part is over, 
the neural part is going to come there and then it's going to get damaged retrocochlear hearing loss especially the example will be acoustic neural these two can be the basic prototype example that can be remembered as simple as that so as you could see so when for example uh, there is something like uh, when a crow is st standing on that antenna what happens is the distortion like as you could see in miniers disease we have to say that the hearing increases and decreases 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 slowly add upon adding upon of uh, that particular hearing loss will be there in miniers disease and retrocochlear hearing loss is something different which is related to the nerve related hearing loss as you could see and there are few tests which uh, we can be able to uh, remember as simple as that as you could see here in this so c c c you can just remember c c c is cochlea okay c c short increment sensitivity index so you can just remember it is given as si si but you can just say c c c okay c c is c that's it so short increment sensitivity index is positive over here so threshold tone decay is related to your uh, retrocochlear pathology so threshold tone decay so i remember i say to the telugu students especially ttd is a board that is present in royal seema rc is royal seema as simple as we can never forget that so ttd board that is tirumala tirupati devasthanam is threshold tone decay it is present in rc that is royal seema it's not in andhra telangana so you can just remember like that so just this is a very big uh, confusion always they make the mistake they lose the mark unnecessarily there is nothing much to know in uh, detail about this test why because this is audiological investigation even the ent surgeons fail to understand this so we have to just remember which test is positive and what okay so it is just like a battery of tests that is being done in this particular you can just remember like that. so when uh, you have got uh, roll over phenomenon so roll over phenomenon is like once uh, it increases and then later on decreases the roll over curve that is in the speech uh, that uh, audiometry the roll over curve will be there that is there in the especially in the case of this retrocochlear pathology so rest all all those things are very simple uh, speech discrimination score is also impaired speech discrimination score is impaired means so the changes in the particular uh, decibel level it cannot be caught up properly especially in the case of retrocochlear pathology so these two are the most important ccc is cochlear and uh, this uh, ttd and uh, roll over curve these are the most important things which you have to keep in mind going deeper into the subject we will write tend to forget the surface unnecessary not needed for uh, neat type co examination okay. it is a audiological subject we have to do msc audiology you have to master that even we also uh, stand a foot behind to understand that wonderful so uh, one very easy thing to remember is sisi is positive S I S I. You can remember C C is there in C. That is cochlea. That's a beautiful point. Then another important thing is the speech discrimination is highly impaired. Already Chandra Shekhar sir said that T V is retrocochlea, antenna is cochlea. So T V is retrocochlea. So uh, that's the reason if the if the tv is not working you cannot listen the sound or anything so speech discrimination is uh, highly impaired you can easily remember then once upon a time old tvs we used to change the channels for which we need to roll so roll over phenomena is what you see with uh, the tv which is retrocochlear so if you remember antenna and cochlea and uh, tv as a retrocochlea many problems get uh, resolved so this is a wonderful way to remember now how do we classify the hearing loss in who so this is uh, one thing which is followed by different uh, protocols uh, you know they say goodman and gilman they say who so who level is enough for the this, this junior level so they say norm, norm normal mild moderate moderate to severe severe total profound this is the regular thing which we follow in uh, ent practice but according to this uh, you can just say 26 to 40 so till 25 it is normal you can just say that some people say till 15 only normal that is a high end classification which is not necessary so 25 decibels that means a sound equal to 25 decibels if he is able to hear it is uh, 20 is uh, normal and 26 to 40 is mild hearing loss moderate is 41 to 55 56 to 70 71 to 91 greater than 91 so greater than 91 profound you can take it like that so this is right. something to remember in practice that's it. now masking is required for air conduction whenever the difference between the healthy and deaf ear 
is at least how many decibels and in all such cases is it the better ear or the suspected deaf ear which need to be masked actually what is the story of masking masking is just like copying sir simply in the examinations people tend to copy we, we, we ask question to someone and then answer is given by someone okay so we ask question to a normal average student the answer is given by a brilliant student they give the answer very fast something like that so normal ear so that is the non test ear they call it as non test ear so test ear and non test ear if it is more than 40 decibels we will have some problem like so when the difference is more the other ear starts catching so you you something called as a baroness noise box baroness noise box to mask the non test ear just remember like that conceptually if we go deeply we forget the surface so just we have to say and remember according to the entrance examination you have to remember something and then and answer will be that's it. nothing wrong in uh, writing answers like this great so masking is basically done in the better ear should be masked it and uh, and at least the difference is 40 decibels it is simply like this if uh, a bridegroom is coming to see the sister there is a elder sister and a younger sister elder sister happens to be more beautiful so that is the reason generally what they used to do is they used to mask that younger sister so that uh, the bride uh, groom will ultimately say okay to the uh, elder sister uh, so that's anyway sali aadi patni hota hai is what they say you know even if it is masked no one can help her. so now uh, in pure tone audiometry uh what is this uh, uh in uh, pure tone audiometry you what is uh, uh graph basically is it normal or abnormal if so then how do we interpret so we have first base to learn the basics are just simple as that so when you go to a temple the bell is hanging vertically so decibel is there in the y axis you can remember like that so decibel level is there in the y axis and frequency is in the horizontal axis so how many times you round roam around the temple is the frequency is it or not is it you do pradakshin that is temple that is the y axis and x axis so bell is hanging vertically so remember like that for every decibel level and at what frequency how much loss is there that is what is called as pure tone audiometry audiometry is measurement of this one so pure tones you give pure tones you don't give any mixed tones like noise so you give pure tones that is you will just say Or that is a 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, or 1.5, 2, like something like that. So air connection and bone connection are two things that are to be kept in mind. So always, always, always bone connection. Uh, like uh, it is broken lines, B for B, broken lines, and air connection for straight lines. So all these notations are there. Uh, you can just say left to right is greater than or less than something like that, and air connection, bone connection, all those notations are the, can be practiced. but they will not be asked in the examination mostly what is the way that you can just say like that and uh, normally air connection is better than bone connection but according to technicality bone connection is always higher than the air connection in this particular uh, particular uh, pure tone audio so if for example i'll just say a small example here like normally as we have seen already the classification that is 25 decibels is normal till 25 the graph is not falling down then it is supposed to be normal so air and bone so there should not be much gap between the air and bone connection so here i'll just say two uh, so two to three small examples like people might have visited some uh, you know exhibition or zoo park the, there is a narrow gauge train there okay so there is one one thing called as meter gauge train so meter gauge train is there in, the, in our childhood it was there in our childhood now it's all broad gauge so the gap between the two tracks is increasing and increasing as you go from narrow gauge and if you say single track is there for example like in japan so they are running on like our metro trains they will be running on single track so for example something like that um, so if the two lines of one ear that is right is red color and left is blue or black color you can say so if the gap between these two is very narrow so almost very near by less than 20 decibels so that is the airborne gap that is called as airborne gap so if they are very near so they are very nearer then it's supposed to be normal there is some amount of gap like something like a broad gauge so the airborne gap is there that is the bone connection uh, is there but air connection is falling down then it is supposed to be a connective deafness and uh, if air connection and bone connection both are coming down then it's supposed to be mixed hearing loss so both air connection and bone connection are coming down it's supposed to be mixed hearing loss so this so you should see the something called as airborne gap so in this particular graph it is almost supposed to be a normal thing 
so it is uh, less than 25 you just see whether we, above 25 it is there and it is a good thing so normally if you get 100 marks we are good but in pure tone audiometry you should be nearer to zero so why because even the slightest of the sound is heard by the normal individuals so it is the slightest of the sound that is equal to triple zero two four times per square centimeter what they say in the healthiest individuals taken from all over the world from 18 to 25 years of age group they calculated the decibel value that is the least possible heard pressure level so based on that they calculate all this uh, decibel etc which is the out of uh, scope of this discussion so in this particular discussion as sar has shown this other graph so this is a broad gauge so broad gauge means the gap has become more and more so at a, especially this should be like uh, as air bone gap is become more and more and as you could see bone connection has a broken line bone connection is suggest to what bone conduction is suggest to of sensory neural hearing loss so if bone is conducting something it is based on the nerves only it's not based on the conduction it is based on the nerves so bone conduction is intact that means sensation is intact and air conduction is falling down that is something which is going through the canal is falling down so that means there is a air bone gap which is more than 20 as uh, an uh, as a you know arbitrary value we can take in. so air conduction is falling down we can say it as a conductive deafness just as simple as to remember broad gaze conductive deafness okay so and uh, now this sir this one sir uh, uh, this is a pure tone audiometry a sloping sensory neural hearing loss as you should see here normally in presby acuses in old age people so sloping sensory neural hearing loss will be there and you can see the last one that is more, never more than 15 to 20 decibels so it is just like a narrow gauge that is the zoo park I mean, someone might have gone uh, trained in the zoo park especially hyderabad nehru zoological park it is very narrow gauge built by bhel people so very narrow gauge almost less than 1 meter so the gap will be very less but uh, here fall is there so gap is very less but fall is there fall is there means bone connection has fallen bone connection has fallen means sensory neural hearing loss gap is not there means it is a narrow gauge means it is a sensory neural hearing loss if fall is also there and gap is there then it should be called as mixed hearing loss as you have seen that means sensory is also there and mixed is also there so if they are trying to catch down and down and down it is sloping sensory neural hearing loss especially in the presby acuses old age people the, it will be like this great so what i understood is the broken line is a uh, bone conduction and the uh, regular straight line is the air conduction they both are very close to each other without any gap if it is normal and uh, that's the reason it is called a narrow gauge you can remember and this is the broad gauge and uh, there is a wide difference between the two and that makes typically a bone con a conductive hearing loss and uh, in this case the air and uh, bone conduction are close to each other but falling together so that is it is a narrow fall together and that That's makes it sensory neural hearing loss but if at all they both are falling uh, but they are widely separated from each other then that becomes a mixed conduction disturbance so yes. that is the way to remember wonderful then another favorite uh, image based mcq which is commonly asked in the neat pg exam sir is uh, the types of tympanograms and where do we see them so this is also simplified with uh, my special i have my own example sir we'll just see tympanogram so tympano is a middle ear so tympano middle ear is a gram is something which is going to weigh it that is it is going to measure it okay as simple as that so what is the status of the middle ear is given by this tympanogram okay middle ear status is given by this tympanogram so normally what happens is as you should say i'll uh, just as a, tell as an example if you take the normal as a curve so this curve is based on this compliance and pressure compliance is the uh, this y axis as you could see here and pressure is the x axis so as you could see compliance resistance or impedance uh, what you can say like that so resistance and impedance and compliance so compliance pressure graph is what is measured in this particular impedance audiometry how much is the negative effect that is produced so you should say when i say something to a student if he follows he is compliant to me he is compliant to my words so please write the notes means he is writing means he is compliant if he is not writing the notes he is impedance he is showing impedance or resistance to me so he is not a good student so when i say for example i put some probe inside the ear canal like this when i put pressure inside the tympanic membrane is moving medially then the tympanic membrane is listening my words 
and if i pull the pressure that is if i suck the pressure like a straw from outside in the canal tympanic membrane is coming towards me so then also it is complete so if you take the graph a sorry please point out the peak of the graph a graph a peak of the graph a if you take that that is zero pressure zero pressure means the tympanic membrane is lying like that so when you are putting a pressure positively so as you could see so that positive pressure also and negative pressure also a graph looks like a only simply so it is a normal tympanic membrane when you put positive pressure like you are pushing air towards the tympanic membrane it is going medially towards the promontory when you are pulling also it is coming each other so you could say the graph is like a you know as you could see in this particular a shaped so that is a type of tympanic uh, impedance audiometric graph uh, which is there in the case of normal tympanic membrane and next uh, and we have to go for ad especially in ossicular discontinuity so ossicular discontinuity what you say is that so it is just like a adamant student who doesn't listen to anything so i doesn't listen to anything d for discontinuity okay uh, so when you are giving a pressure inside and outside why the tympanic membrane is moving because it is connected to the ossicles and connected to the round window and uh, oval window as a part of its preferential pathway oval window and round window as a part of this preferential pathway so when there is discontinuity of the ossicular chain whatever the pressure that you are giving there is no peak so there is somehow there is movement but there is no peak that you are not able to so peak is at the infinity as you could see in that so they are not meeting each other ossicular discontinuity d for discontinuity as simple as that a shallow so for example ossicular uh, chain has got some sclerosis defect like otosclerosis like especially the tympani the foot plate of the shape is or something like is fixed like that so it is listening but not listening completely so it is listening but not listening completely therefore a shallow is present in the case of otosclerosis b type b type you just remember bomb b o m bomb bomb is nothing but so b for otitis media with effusion so what it is media with effusion so it is like a flat curve so what happens in otitis media with effusion is there is a water in medial to the tympanic membrane so when you are giving so sir has drawn it like that so there uh, there is some amount of so negative pressure or positive pressure the reaction is very less and it is a flat curve as you could see so that uh, only for the sake of that uh, small reaction you just say flat curve b type in otitis media and if you take c type c type is eustachian tube dysfunction c type is eustachian tube dysfunction means so what is happening the peak is negative peak why the negative peak is there eustachian tube dysfunction already the tympanic membrane is pulled medially there is negative pressure in the middle ear so when you are putting negative pressure in the middle ear and you also have to pull it towards you means you have to put negative pressure to get it towards you so c type eustachian tube dysfunction b type otitis media with effusion a type normal ad type ossicular uh, discontinuity as type a shallow otosclerosis S for yes, otosclerosis. D for D discontinuity. A is the normal thing. C for eustachian tube dysfunction. B for Bombay. I told you B O M. What what is media with effusion? C is the only thing you have to remember. C E T D eustachian tube dysfunction. C C followed by E followed by T followed by D E T D eustachian. So that way you can answer these questions. Yeah. Um, I'll once more. Uh, uh, what is the order to remember, sir? First. First, A, sir. Just say A. Okay. A is the normal thing, and uh, A D. A D, sir. A D is the ossicular discontinuity. Yes. Then A S term, which is A shallow, uh, sir. A shallow. Shallow term. Okay. A shallow. Then comes the B curve. B curve. B for B. Just remember B O M bomb. Okay, and C curve is negative peak pressure with the eustachian tube. Great. So once more, the BERA, the brainstem evoked response audiometry, and uh, what are the various waves is a favorite question. Already, sir has mentioned E equal. E is distal part of eighth nerve. Wave two is proximal part of eighth nerve. C is the cochlear nucleus and lower pons, mm -hmm. and uh, O is superolivary complex, lateral limb discus, which is in the upper pons, and the inferior colliculus is seventh and eighth. Now, what are the scenarios where we do the brainstem evoked response audiometry? Sir? Uh,
Okay, I think uh, Sir will be once more joining back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Sir lost the connection. He'll be joining back. Okay. So meanwhile, uh, uh, yeah, I think Sir joined back. Yeah. Right. Very good. Yeah. So, okay, sir. Sorry for the this the small amount of technical error, sir. Uh, sir, this Bera, sir, I'll tell simplifiedly. Uh, a lion is sleeping inside the den, sir. You want to see whether the lion is functioning or not. So you are throwing a stone. Okay. So lion is nothing but the auditory pathway. Every part of the lion, whether it is functioning or not. So if you are hitting the stone on the head, it shouts. If you are hitting the stone on the tail, it wags the tail. If you are hitting the stone on the body, it moves the body. And hitting on uh, legs, it is moving the legs. Something like that. So E. E. Cola M. A. is the lion here. And you are giving tone clicks or beeps sound. So whether it is functioning or not, some waves are produced from that particular parts of the E. E. Cola M. A. And uh, of which fifth wave is very important, lateral lemniscus. And uh, each and every part is steady. Of course, this Bera is an incomplete test. If you go into details of it, which is not needed for this level. But whether the auditory pathway is functionally existing or not. So whether the lion is dead or lion is alive. If lion is alive, definitely it shows some reaction. So that is what is about the Bera. It will help us in knowing about the retrocochlear pathology. And because the patient's cooperation is not needed, patient, even in the case of coma or brainstem death also, you can diagnose that. Patient's response is not needed. It is an objective test. We can test it. And you can say cochlear and retrocochlear pathology. And what part of the auditory system is pro problem, if you can say that. Especially in the neonatal screening program, Bera and uh, photoacoustic emissions are the two tests that are being done. Whether the child is hearing or not by birth, whether we can do cochlear implants or not, one of the battery of the test is this Bera. So this way you can just remember about Bera simply. Fifth wave, wow. most important, robust. And as physicians, very commonly, multiple stenosis is a scenario where the visual evoked potentials, if it is optic nerve involvement is there, and whenever the auditory pathway is involved with a demyelinating plops, very often Bera is being ordered uh, clinically, and even for the pontine tumors also, um, typically, because it is the lower part of the pons, the pontomedullary junction is the area where you have the auditory and uh, uh, the cochlear uh, nuclei. Now, this audiogram, where do we see this shape of audiogram in a case of uh, sensory neural hearing loss, sir? So sloping sensory neural hearing loss, sir. You can see it in presbyacusis, as you could see. And sometimes, you know, they say Meniere's disease, early stages, it is there. And uh, Meniere's disease, middle stage, it is straight. And then uh, later on, Meniere's disease, late stage, it is like that. I call it as a trident shape. If you make a trident like this, initially it will be here, and later here, and uh, later it will be like this. Sir. So you can just remember like that. Great. So... But typically, uh, higher frequencies are affected more. Uh, Presbyacusis, so, sloping sensory nerve hearing loss. Yes. Uh, this noise induced hearing loss, sir. 4, 4K had the uh, DPs there, sir. Noise induced hearing loss. Oh, that is very uh, important. Noise induced hearing loss is a 4K, 4,000 yes. uh, frequency yes. hearing loss. Yes. So, so this you can see. Yeah. Yes, sir. Carry on, sir. Carry on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. So, uh, this will be uh, there in the Meniere's disease, sir. As we have seen, the improving pattern. And then, uh, as I told you, in Meniere's disease, you remember if uh, Lord Shiva's trident is there like this, initially, you bend it like this. Initially, it will be falling, then, then it will be neutral, and then it will be raising like this. You can just see in the textbook also. Initially, lower frequencies are affected. Why like this means? So, because the cochlea is getting enlarged and then decreased, enlarged and decreased, every time it enlarges and decreases, there is some amount of addition of the hearing loss. So, so as the, based on the addition of the hearing loss, it has got you know raising pattern, falling pattern, and then stable pattern, something like that. So, in different stages. This is only an explanatory way that you can just understand. Uh, this is a question that can be given for theoretical purpose. Great. Then, uh, 
where do we any reasoning in this sir? something actually is something called as physiology of hearing comes into picture here sir actually weaver lorentz theory it says that the periphery of the tympanic membrane vibrates more than the center so according to some experiments and uh, the particular uh, ossicles that is called as preferential pathway sir so preferential pathway once again as i told you the shortcut provided by the nature is these ossicles so these ossicles were like you know uh, teeth in the fishes so they are modified by the nature and by the way humans developed you know they are like uh, uh as they are related to gill apparatus etc etc so they come uh, for the rescue of hearing better so when we have a tympanic membrane sir when you have a tympanic membrane intact but ossicles are not there it in fact the tympanic membrane is producing a obstruction to the sound you can just simply remember like that so the cable is being cut there so the connection is not occurring there but if the tympanic membrane is not there also as a perforation so the ossicles can have some amount of conduction so always 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 remember conduction is the shortcut that is provided by the nature that the simple thing is to understand this sir and as you could see i'll tell you something easy to remember here also so when you close your ears just say so 30 decibel simply you can just remember like the 30 decibel here and uh, perforation of the tympanic membrane is a bit more than that that is 40 decibels to going inner and near ossicular interruption with intact drum is causing 54 decibels so just if you remember that and uh, with perforation means mostly they try to give the question in between these two only okay 10 to 25 decibels so you could see the perforation second one is also 10 decibels and then ossicular interruption with perforation also 10 decibels so this is like you know what to say it is a what is a crude question or rude question on the students very difficult to remember this after doing 5 to 10 years of service in ent we tend to remember it easily but there is no point in giving but the concept should be understood that cognitive deafness is the uh, you know key behind the proper hearing shortcut if you understand that this question matters a, a bit uh, you know val value for that understanding so absolutely so the last question for the today's evening very close close link between the neurology and the ent is the vertigo the peripheral vertigo versus central vertigo uh, any points that you uh, want to us to remember or do we need to really uh, remember this just like that no sir just as simple as that i'll just say only once again as a government example so central government state government so central government is a cns state government is the ent year year path okay so vertigo as far as uh, is nothing but the hallucination of movement so as simple as that so it can be because of central causes which are more dangerous central cause for example someone has a brain tumor somewhere in the you know mid brain or pons or medulla so that is more dangerous tumor is there means tumor will be there forever and it has to be removed until then it vertigo will not go so remember something like that central for example central government orders it is like a you know sharp point lockdown you have to keep means they will have state government has to follow that so they will have to follow and once something like that central uh, this related nystagmus once it is there there is nothing like a latency there is nothing like a duration direction fatigue but nothing will be there will, will be there there are state government that is vestibular system as simple as that latency duration direction fatigue but so because you know our people because we give some amount of exemption for that you know our state only you know our local party you know something like that central government is very rude for example i am telling you, not blaming anybody so in that way you can just simply remember like that so latency duration direction fatigability all these things will be there for this particular uh, peripheral system peripheral system especially there are three things so frontal nerve system you have got a brain and all those spinal cord and all those connections etc peripheral system you have got visual system and vestibular system and then somatosensory system so remember your uh, test best test hyderabadi player vvs lakshman visual vestibular somatosensory vvs so vvs is the peripheral vestibular system and uh, you should have a basic idea about uh, the nystagmus also something like you know push pull mechanism so when if it is a eye problem so always ent and after departments are side by side together in the medical college also so as like in our body so this vestibular system and visual system are linked together 
so when you say the pendular system like pendular nystagmus is there equally moving like that it could be probably a uh, this particular visual part visual related or what uh, this nystagmus and uh, especially i'll try to brief the nystagmus also why the nystagmus should be there so nystagmus is the hint for us hint for us that there is something wrong in this particular system so it is a hint for us so irregular rhythmic oscillator oscillator eye movements irregular iro so not isro iro irregular rhythmic oscillatory eye movements which say that there is some problem in the eyes or this particular ears that is vestibular system so which is their connections so it is just like a hint that is given without investigation you can see there so 30 cm distance you have to keep and then see the nystagmus these are all basics i am telling i am not going to details only for the understanding so visual system nystagmus is something like a pendular and especially the vestibular system is jerky jerky type of nystagmus so smooth movement is there hello yeah smooth yes. movement is there yes sir audible sir smooth movement is there means you should think of eye related issues these are only basics not going to details and uh, there is jerky that is something like jerk 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 something like that so it is related to the vestibular system and you know uh, so up and down movement most commonly related to the central nervous system so all these things that are there the table which you have given sir most of the things are covered which i told you right now uh, most of the things can be read from the table and uh, this is a basic concept behind that whenever there is a vertigo patient we have to rule out whether it is a central vertigo or peripheral vertigo so peripheral vertigo especially like bpb is the most common so it is called as benign the name itself says benign paroxysmal positional vertigo in particular position you take the particular position especially the dix halpike test as you know the details of it dix halpike you, you see in a particular position there will be a latency there is a duration there is a direction there is a fatigability fatigability means once the vertigo comes after that the vertigo subsides slowly so the so first attack will be more severe and later on the attacks will be a bit okay for the patient so you can also say that it is a benign condition so fatigability will be there don't worry you have to see and at the end of the day if a student is intelligent so the vertigo patient first goes to the neurologist because he has got very fear anything in the brain okay and then uh, he will be referred there from there all the departments go at the end he land to pnt department so that itself says that it is a benign condition and uh, we have to give some maneuvers of course neurologist also gives we also give and uh, by the way if there is any problem like csom or any cholestetoma or anything eroding the labyrinth that is to be seen by the ent and then it is a surgically repairable thing and many years disease also there are some surgeries and uh, whatever the bpp we also can manage by the ent so it's like a combined uh, department like neck by surgery and then uh, the anesthesia people and then ent people neck is handled by everybody like tracheostomy done by everybody so vertigo is a combined topic so gross idea which i have given great hopefully it is uh, one easy way to remember is uh, as uh, uh, chandrashekar said rightly says central is something that has no rules nothing so no change no it is absent no 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 nahi 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 is central and i think is central is purely vertical that means if something wrong in the brain we straight go to the heaven so it is purely vertical then as here in the periphery it can be horizontal or torsional if it is ocular problem then it is smooth and if it is vestibular problem then it is more jerky in nature and uh, fatigability is a characteristic feature of the peripheral because it is most of the times benign and lot of patients also know uh, that um, in the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo patients uh, even if she is a housewife also at the age of uh, 60 65 she knows very well that how to get up slowly from the bed and how to do the neck exercises and this is not going to be there forever and it is going to fatigue that's what even a granny ma with uh, or a housewife also can be able to tell uh, about the fatigability of the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo as an undergraduate i often used to have this as a tough topic but the first time i was very easy with the topic is after talking to around four to five of the real patients of the benign positional vertigo who will actually demonstrate and show you what are the positions where they get it then that is like reading harrison about 100 times so that way wonderful so where do we see pure vertical nystagmus 
down beating vertical nystagmus, up beating vertical nystagmus, purely rotatory nystagmus, and pure horizontal nystagmus. This is one of the favorite uh, neat PGMC for the nystagmus. Yes, sir. So, vertical nystagmus, down beating nystagmus are also all related to CNS, sir. As you could see, the first point. So, quantum medullary junction or cerebellar lesions or vestibular basilar insufficiency. So, these are something to be remembered theoretically. Down beating, as you know, Arnold Shear malformation, cerebellar degeneration, yes, sir. And uh, purely up beating, quantum medullary junction. So, up beating means you have to look up towards the PM, quantum medullary junction, and pons and midbrain. So you look about the pons and midbrain. That is something related to uh, you know, a central nervous system, especially in the axis. So purely rotatory, as you could see in pendular syringomyelia, syringomyelia, and uh, purely horizontal and cerebral lesions. So these are uh, a bit of more uh, more something related to CNS rather than ENT. So mostly we yeah. have to remember these things. Absolutely. So. Quickly, 10 points about the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo that we can have in our tips for the neat PG exam, sir. So, BPPV, the name itself says benign, not dangerous, paroxysmal, suddenly occurring, positional to a particular position, vertigo, vertigo will be there. So, when we have got the otoconial debris, sir, so we have got some small, for example, salt like granules in the posterior semicircular canals. So when it is being, when there is movement, they get settled one place. And then when it is moved to a particular head position, so particular, for example, right lateral or left lateral position, as well as head hanging position, when if it is there. So when they touch the, this uh, generally this debris, whenever it touches, it causes stimulation of the particular thing and causes a geotropic nystagmus. Towards the earth, there will be nystagmus, something like that. And uh, more commonly, it can be because of the trauma or it can be because of old age, degenerative condition. And uh, it is a fatigable, as you know, BPPV, all the points you have to know about the peripheral vertigo, you can just say that. And it may be associated with nausea, it's a point. And latent geotropic fatigable, as we have already seen. So latency will be there. So five, 10 to 15 seconds latency will be there. And it means it takes some time to manifest when you are putting. Diagnosis is by means of Dick's Halpike maneuver. And treatment is by means of Epilis maneuver or Simons maneuver. Epilis maneuver or Simons maneuver. And there are a lot of maneuvers which are not important as far as the entrance exam is concerned. Right. So, last question for the evening. Elderly diabetic, painful ear discharge, facial nerve palsy, no response to treatment, and decreased uptake on technetium bone scan. So all these are highly suggestive of one diagnosis. So it's uh, a misnomer, sir. Actually, malignant otitis externa, pseudomonas infection. So malignant otitis externa, especially called as skull base osteomyelitis. So what happens is it presents with, I'm uh, telling that it presents with granulations in the external artery canal. Normally, external artery canal doesn't have any granulations, something like that. But there is an inflammatory change, a rapid inflammatory change that is present in the external artery canal, which you could see it is not getting decreased. And patient has got very much uh, painful, especially like as you are seeing this black fungus cases nowadays, it is a diabetic related, immunocompromised related, debilitated or organ transplant. We see in the ICUs generally, they call us for the ENT opinion, especially in the ICUs who are debilitated and elderly. And painful ear discharge, the pain is very important. So for that reason only, initial days, they might have called it as malignant otitis externa. And uh, especially associated with facial palsy. Facial palsy is very important. One of the important nerves that is uh, related to that uh, particular thing is the facial nerve that can be getting. Patient may be presenting with facial nerve palsy only. And technetium bone scan is for uh, this one. And uh, especially caused by pseudomonas, generally we give antibodies, especially ciprofloxacin. That is one drug which we give for weeks together. Orally also some patients we have seen. Patients healing orally also with oral treatment with ciprofloxacin also for three to four, seven weeks, something like that, we try to cure. Right. And uh, hint should be there, sir. That is called as skull base osteomyelitis. It goes towards the skull base and then it should be debrided. If it is going to osteomyelitis, if it is there, means you have to debride and then, uh, you know, you have to do surgical repair also. Sometimes. Wonderful. So that brings us to the end of this uh, Wonderful. Without knowing, we finished about one hour. 
there as uh, when we are didactically teaching sitting alone uh, one never looks very painful but this one hour of discussion looks like uh, having a ward rounds with dr chandrashekar and uh, uh, thank you so much and we'll have many more sessions uh, and vibrant evenings like this and thanks all rishab shetty and everyone uh, uh, joining the session and uh, coincidentally incas is a very favorite name for us and um, uh, now the edutech startup that we started is also called as incas and uh, we are uh, we want to